Hello, good morning. Welcome to Joy News. That's so coming to you live from our studios in Kokumilim. Coming up this morning, Doom sort to end in a few days. Words of ECG board chairman as he apologizes to Ghanaians for the pain caused by the incessant outages. An arrangement in place to procure additional fuel to run all our thermal plants and, and power producing plants. Also this morning, newly outdoor NDC running mate Professor J. Nana Opokwajeman vows all public officials will be prosecuted in the next NDC administration. John and I have agreed that whoever has participated in the plunder of the state must be held accountable. She will have oversight among others of the education sector, the health sector, gender and social protection. Plus, fourth estate demands publishing of full KPMG audit report in the GRE SML contract after the president asked GRE to continue with the contract to monitor the downstream petroleum sector. I would be very measured in perhaps uh, attacking KPMG until I see the KPMG report. Because I did a JIDA investigation, the president issued some directives on the JIDA report. We have details for you shortly. My name is Aisha Bryan. Please do stay for details. President Ekufuado has reiterated his government's commitment in investing in the country's power sector. He says several policies and measures have been outlined to incentivize green investment and foster a culture of energy efficiency. President Ekufuado made the statement at the commissioning of 15 peak megawatt solar power plants at Kaliu in the Upper West Region. Joy News' is Upper West Regional Correspondent Rafiq Salam has more. President Akufado noted that the commissioning of the 15 mega solar power project at Keleo is not just about providing electricity but represented a fundamental shift towards sustainable development. He averred that renewable energy sources such as solar power does not only reduce the country's reliance on fossil fuel but also help reduce the effect on climate change as well. By investing in renewable energy infrastructure, we're securing a reliable source of electricity and creating new opportunity for economic growth and job creation. This plant will not only power homes and businesses, but also serve as a catalyst for development in the Upper West region, attracting investment and spurring innovation. To this end, government is implementing a series of policies and measures to incentivize green investments, foster a culture of energy efficiency, and prioritize the development of solar, wind, and hydroelectric power projects as key strategy for the growth of the energy sector in the country. Vision However, is not only to be energy self-sufficient, but also to set the stage for Ghana to emerge as an eco-friendly country in the region, inspiring neighboring countries to follow suit in their pursuit of a greener, more energy technology-centered future. President Nakuvadu spoke of the benefits that the people in the region and the country at large will derive from the commissioning of the solar power plant. Apart from this plant, adding 15 megawatts of power to the national electricity grid will also improve the quality of power supply in the Upper West Region, reduce national carbon emissions by displacing energy that gas-fired thermal plants would otherwise have generated. I'm told that that is estimated at 8,000 
117 tons. We will also promote practical studies on the development of solar power by the technical universities in the northern part of the country. As I indicated two years ago, government is continuously investing in the electricity transmission network to enable the country to evacuate more reliable renewable energy through the national grid to support the extension of electricity to all parts of the country. Deputy Minister for Energy, Habert Krapa, assured Ghanaians of the plans put in place by President Kufado to ensure in that the power outages in the country are a thing of the past. His Excellency, the President has ensured, led all of us in the power sector to ensure that we are putting arrangements in place to procure additional fuel to run all our thermal plants and, and power producing plants at full capacity. And His Excellency, the President, has also led realignment of operational and technical arrangement in the entire power sector value chain, which is the reason I'm able to assure the people of Ghana that in the next few days, the power challenges that we are seeing under the leadership of His Excellency the President, it will be a thing of the past. The project was funded by the German Development Bank, KFW, at 60 million euros with counterpart funding from the Volta River Authority, VRA, at 8.2 million euros. Kofi Tutu Ajare is the board chair of Volta River Authority. As part of the company, our commitment to ensure the provision of clean and reliable and sustainable power. The completion of this plant today has enormous benefits to the Kaleo community and by extension, the northern parts of the country. I think it is true to say that with this plant up and running, this community will be the first community in Ghana including the lower area, to run solely on power, on solar power, on the days. There were representatives from the Spanish, German embassies, and the European Union at the function. Our power regional minister, Stephen Yakubu, disclosed that the project is of enormous importance to the people, starting from the construction stage, which has employed several people in the region. During its construction phase, the project provided employment opportunities for several individuals, with 95% hailing from nearby communities. Additionally, the project's corporate social respons responsibility initiatives, including the re rehabilitation of the Kalio DA Primary School, improvement of road infrastructure, and the potential for tourism development exemplify our commit commitment to holistic development and community empowerment. The Keleo solar power plant will increase Ghana and via the capacity to 50 megawatts. It will also diversify the energy portfolio by adding more renewable energy to its fold. Reporting for Joy News, Rafik Salam, Keleo. Board Chair of the Electricity Company of Ghana, Herbert Krapa, has since apologized to Ghanaians for the intermittent power cut. The apology was post, posted on his Facebook page. It reads, and we'll be reading to, it for you shortly. You'll have it on your screens. He's been apologizing to you for your patience. And he says, we are fully confident that the... Um, Measures put in place will fix the problem um, shortly. And he says that we empathize with all consumers and apologize unreservedly for the effects of the outages on our daily lives. Meanwhile, the Institute of Climate and Environmental Governance has since been offering some expert analysis on who must provide a load shedding. And I'll be sharing excerpts of that statement with you shortly. The Institute of Climate and Environmental Governance has taken note 
of recent statements made by the senior presidential advisor, Yao Safo Mafo. The statement suggested only the energy minister uh, possesses the authority to order the publication of a power rationing timetable. In light of the ensuing concerns, ICEG aims at providing clarification on this matter and underscore the importance of collaborative efforts and transparency in addressing the challenges. While acknowledging the critical role of government agencies, including Ministry of Energy, managing and coordinating energy-related activities, it is crucial to emphasize the provision of Section 3 of the Public Utilities Regulatories Act Act 538. According to this section, the PURC is tasked with safeguarding the interests of both consumers and utility service providers. Additionally, the PRC is empowered to perform any other function incidental to its primary responsibility, given that the publication of the Doomsday timetable directly impacts consumers' activities and interests, the PRC has authority to order its release. Contrary to the senior presidential advisor's statement, the decision to publish the Doomsday timetable is not solely within the purview of the energy minister. Instead, it necessitates a coordinated approach involving input from various institutions, including the PURC. Meanwhile, workers of the electricity company of Ghana in the Ashanti region say they have been forced to abandon the revenue mobilization exercise for fear of their lives. They say they are afraid the conduct of the Ashanti Regional Minister Simon Osei Mensah, who ordered the arrest of the general manager for Ashanti Region, Ashanti East, for failing to connect Kumasi Technical University, could embolden members of the public to attack the staff. Chairman of the Senior Staff Association of ECG Ashanti West, John Mensah, tells Joy News the action of the Regional Minister has affected the performance of the workers. The workers are in red as they hoist red flags in protest of the arrest of the Ashanti East General Manager for failing to heed calls to reconnect power to Kumasi Technical University. The workers say they have been infuriated by the conduct of the Ashanti Regional Minister, Simon Ose Mensah, who also doubles as chairman of the Regional Security Council, RESEC. They have been demanding an unqualified apology from the Regional Minister and also withdrawing the police case. Chairman of the Senior Staff Association of ECG, Ashanti West, John Mensah says the workers are afraid of their lives as a result of the conduct of the Ashanti Regional Minister. We are still going on the revenue mobilization exercise. Our people are there. They are disconnecting, they are collecting revenue. So if the minister can call the arrest of a, a, a general, general manager for a region, then the staff are not safe. The staff who are doing the mo revenue mobilization in order to get money to fuel the plant and then to take us out of the, 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 what do you call it, the energy crisis. And you, the minister, you are still pushing. You are encouraging that they shouldn't pay their bill. Then I think that one is unfortunate. So that is why we are saying that we should withdraw the case from the police station so that the staff will have the confidence to visit the, 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 the houses or the premises and collect the revenue. It's a form of threat. It's a form of threat to our members. On Monday, the National Executive Council of the ECG Workers' Union bowed all four regional managers of the company in the Ashanti region who are automatic members of the Ashanti Regional Security Council from attending meetings called by the regional minister. Vice Chairman of the Senior Staff Association, Bismarck Kaduma, tells Joy News the workers have been infuriated by the regional minister who has been defending his action on radio. You only heard me on radio defending what he did. It makes us uncomfortable. Somebody doing his genuine work and causing his arrest, and you are on radio defending it. So it makes us very, very uncomfortable. Meanwhile, the workers warned their next line of action could be dire if the regional minister fails to apologize or withdraw the case against the general manager. Yusuf Osmanu Abdullah is the chairman of the Senior Workers' Union, Ashanti East. We are not deterred. Even if his house is owing, it should be prepared. We are coming on them. Yes. If you are owing, you are a customer, you need to pay. That's all. If he's not owing, we don't have problem with him. But if he's owing, we are coming on him, so he should be prepared.
I told you this is the first step, and we have a series of, and we've got to the bridge, we'll cross it. The vulnerable is Owen, and we are disconnecting. How much more the, 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 the regional minister? It's better for him, or someone should tell him to go and withdraw the case and apologize to the entire ECG fraternity. The workers' front are not happy with his actions. From Kumasi, for Joy News, I'm Interior reporting. NDC running mate Professor Nana Jane Okokwajiman has vowed the next NDC administration will prosecute corrupt government officials. She made the promise at her adoring last night at the University of Professional Studies, Accra. She also took a swipe at government over what she believes is mismanagement of the economy. My colleague James Savage has more. <laughs> Draped in the symbolic red, white, green, and black colors of the umbrella, hundreds of NDC sympathizers and party bigwigs gather here at the UPSC Auditorium in Accra to witness the outdooring of Professor Jenana Opokwajiman as running mate to John Dramani Mahama. Professor Jane Nana Opoku Ajimai. Chairman of the party, Johnson Asedu Nketja, set the tone for the night by bursting the bubbles of those anxiously waiting for appointment in the next NDC government. Some people are not only fighting about the positions they will occupy. They are telling all others that they will be the key makers and they will be making their appointment. If we are not careful... This will dampen the enthusiasm and the spirit of our followers. Rolling out her vision to party faithfuls and Ghanaians, Professor Jane Nana Opokwa Jiman did not shy away from taking a swipe at government. I don't know about you, but the image I get looking at that hole is a trench in utter shock that anyone could believe. It was intended as a thanksgiving gift to the almighty, invisible, God only wise. Such a report will not find COVID money shared for partisan political campaign purposes. I will not, in the advancement of self serving ambition, declare to the whole world that I was only the driver's mate. So what will her government offer Ghanaians? The, the report will highlight new roads, harbors, railway lines, not what we've seen of late, Ayalolo buses. You will find the lack of intimidation of opposing voices. You will find serious investment and practice to, to enable a digitized economy and society. The report will go on to point at housing projects, including the famous Saglemi housing complex. And even those that somebody has happily raised to make room for a presumed... Knowing the role Vice President Dr. Mahmoud Baumia is playing as head of the economic management team, and lead on government digitization agenda and what may be expected of the next vice president, former president John Dramani Mahama explains what the exact job description of his vice president will be. She has great insights into human resource management, empowerment and social development. And under my administration, she will have oversight among others of the education sector, the health sector, gender and social protection. <laughs> Professor Jin Nana Opokwajiman says the next NDC administration would deal with all corrupt government officials. John and I have agreed that whoever has participated in the plunder of the state must be held accountable. And my friends, this is not a threat. 
it is a promise. As to whether this second John and Jane ticket will deliver victory for the NDC camp December 7, 2024, the race has just begun. James Savage, Joy News. Well, I've been joined by Dr. Kwame Asasante, his senior political science lecturer at the Department of Political Science at the University of Ghana for a conversation. I'm grateful for your time, Doc. Uh, let me first gauge your appreciation of Professor Nana Jinopokwajiman's delivery yesterday. Hello, Doc. Kindly unmute for me. Good morning to you, Aisha. Can you hear me? Loud and clear, Doc. Right. I think uh, yesterday what we witnessed uh, was nothing but a true reflection of what um, somebody who intends to be a leader, and specifically we're talking about Rani Bait, has to be. You are bold, you are fearless, and then you are aware of the problems of the society, and you are ready uh, to fix them when opportunity comes your way. And that is exactly what we saw. Mm. Th there's much talk about how the professor's partnership will increase the NDC's fortunes, especially in the central region. What are your thoughts on this? Is it automatic? Yeah, sometimes, and I've been following media conversation about what he brought to uh, the ticket the last time and what is it uh, going to be this time around. That conversation about what he brought to the ticket, I don't know where it's coming from because I am ready to see any research that people have done that is able to disaggregate the votes that um, parties obtained in the last election. For you to know that this one, it was Nana who brought it. This one, it was John Mahama. These are other facts. Uh, this relates to other factors and all that. All that I'm saying is that there are various factors that influence voter choices. One is the economy, infrastructure development, uh, the fight against corruption, rule of law, unemployment, and a host of them, in addition to what? Energy and energy crisis, how you are going to fix this. So, of course, I am not oblivious of the fact that the personality of what the president or the running mate or the flag bearer is also critical. Some people look at these things. But beyond that, people look at even constituency-specific issues. If there's a place where they are looking for market, uh, for women to what, apply their vocation, and they don't find that, they don't care who's about, who is the running mate or the leader of the party. So that argument that what did she bring the last time <laughs> for me is a WAP argument. Uh, the whole uh, you know, um, analysis is wrong. There are so many factors. But of course, if you have anybody who is going to be in the uh, seat as what? A running mate, you should have certain qualities that will really allow people to what? Follow her. People will support her. That will also make it attractive to people to follow. But that person alone cannot be the factor that influence both actually. So all the analysis you see in the media are basically wrong. Wrong analysis. I must be blunt about it. Right. For, yes. for me, if you look at Nana, go ahead, Doc. If you look at Nana's, yes, uh, you know, inclusion in the tickets, uh, obviously, you are looking at somebody who is experienced. Uh, you are looking at somebody who is popular. You are talking about a game of numbers. So, popularity counts a lot. Uh, her university work and the work as a, a politician in the ministry, which is Ministry of Education. Remember, in politics, the ministry will hold, will make you popular or not. And uh, once you are looking at Ghanaian society, almost every home, there is what? Education going on. So if there's a policy the minister, uh, during her tenure, was able to put in place, it's obviously her name become a family, a household name, and the rest of this add to the popularity. You are looking for somebody who can step into the shoes of the president when the president is incapable of continuing his tenure. Uh, you are looking at somebody with many constituencies. Look at this woman. It comes from so many constituents, apart from her natural constituency of the um, central region, specifically where she comes from in a particular constituency. Um, she also appeals to uh, people, the gender groups, academics, uh, women, uh, by and large, and the general society. Of course, uh, the MP, NDC as a party 
So all these things are things that are going to what, support her to be able to what, add to the ticket and make the ticket meaningful. For, for many, uh, Professor Jane Nanopokwajiman's promise, because she actually emphasized that it's not a threat, but it's a promise that the NDC will go after people who plundered a state uh, so they face the full rigors of the law, uh, is quite refreshing. But whether that will ever happen is what many uh, are questioning now. Do you, ever, do you believe that can ever happen, considering how politicians cover up for each other? All these things can be done if the leaders themselves decide that, look, we will make sure that there is accountability, there's probity. After all, this is not a threat. If you read our constitution, the preamble of it, I mean, part of it saying that we, the people of this country, believe in what accountability, that at each point in time, we will hold our leaders for their actions and inactions. That's it. And if you extend the conversation to the concept of good governance, accountability is a, a critical component of it, that public officers will be held to account for their stewardship of their office. So um, that is, is there for everybody. And in governance, anybody who leaves office, prepare, be prepared that you'll be called upon at any time to answer questions. And that's not a threat. It's part of the oils that grease the wheels of governance so that it doesn't bring it toward a halt. Uh, so I think that if NDC is serious about it, and it's not going to be just a mere talk, then we want to see them, if power is given to them, implementing this thing to the fullest. Otherwise, let them remember that in politics, what goes around comes around. If you promise this, you are given opportunity, and you do otherwise. The next time you want your mandate to be renewed, I'm afraid you are not going to get that. Already, the flag bearer has indicated some sensitive sectors that she will directly have control over when the NDC or if the NDC wins power. I mean, including education ministry, uh, gender ministry, um, health, employment. Do you see her to have what it takes uh, for the kind of efficiency needed in these sectors? I don't know what Ghanaians expect of uh, a woman who has gone through the mill and has risen to this level. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. She has all the experience. In terms of knowledge, he has all that. People who have occupied this position previously, do they match up in terms of her pedigree, in terms of what, uh, you know, experience, the quality of person she is? No. Don't, don't forget I... that the academia is different from the real life issues. Yeah, what is different about, are you not managing human resources? Are you not managing? Remember that the university is a microcosm of what the country. All ethnic groups are there. All religious groups are there. All workers are there. When you are managing, you are managing both home and abroad. There are foreign students who, there, uh, who are there. You are managing resources. And I'm telling you, there's a big one. For you to be able, able to even go through the mail and get to that talk, it is not easy. I'm telling you. So uh, if you think that, or if somebody thinks that, oh, he has gone through the university and it's not enough, I'm afraid. That's a big one. Let them occupy just a position as a head of department. They run away and leave their sandals behind. And I challenge people who are saying that, look, he's old, he's this and that, and that uh, he's not fit for purpose and all that. If those people have those individuals in their homes, I challenge them to bring them forward. And then, you know, mention their names to other parties to use them as running mate. Then we are in competition. Otherwise, they should keep their mouth shut. I'm not saying that this woman, you know, uh, there is nothing that can be said against it and all that. But the issue is that if you have anything, bring it out. That is the basis of it. Because my understanding is that we are making sure that we bring the women up to scratch. We develop them to become the best for society. So if you want to undermine them unnecessarily, people like that will stand up and then support them. All women, it doesn't matter the political divide you find yourself. And I challenge those people that whatever they have against any of any of our you know, running mates, including this woman, they should bring it forward. And that will enhance the conversation and make it better. But for me, she has the experience, he has the capacity, he has the wherewithal to be able to manage any office. Remember that the public office is not run by an individual alone. We use the bureaucrats to run the affairs of the state. So where she falls short in terms of what expertise other public officials 
the bureaucrats will support her to lift up her game. After all, if we've seen the leaders who have had, some are engineers, some are lawyers, they've been able to manage this office. How much more uh, somebody who has administered at the university level as uh, a CEO of the university and has held a position as a minister for education, that big portfolio. I can say without fear of contradiction that you will be able to manage the affairs of the state. Well, if on, on, on that, on, give them um, the power. Undoubtedly, there are high expectations, actually, not because uh, even though she's not the flag bearer, but also because she'll become the first woman vice president this country has produced. And if the NDC wins power and also because there are a lot of people who have uh, said that she really doesn't have any magic uh, for the NDC to win power. I mean, what are your expectations of her? The woman is going to complete the uh, complement the effort of John Mahama, and of course, they will build on their party's what uh, works, their records, to be able to uh, win support of the people. It is the duty of Ghanaians to assess them whether uh, it is a party worth considering uh, for this time around, and what once that decision is made by the general masses of the people, at the end of the day. Uh, they will give them their vote and then they win the election. If that is not the case, Ghanaians will show which party is ready for their service. So it's just a matter of time. But we want quality people to show up and demonstrate knowledge that they understand our situation. They are ready to deal with our problems head on and they are going to govern us with all what honesty so that we know that we can entrust our political uh, power in their care. If you have people who can just come and then will promise heavens and then give us something that is not meaningful, we'll take political notice of that. And when opportunity avails itself the next time, we'll throw them out. It's a simple matter. I'm grateful for your time. Dr. Sasante, he is a senior political science lecturer with the University of Ghana Department of Political Science. He's also head of the Center for European Studies at the university. And election headquarters is brought to you by Petrosol, your clean fuel in full quantity, Chartered Institute of Management Accountants, the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants, together as the Association of International Certified Professional Accountants, and German Ozone Medical Center, Alternative Therapy, Dental, Wellness, and Beauty. Let's move on to other stories and investigators on the GRA SML deal are demanding the publication of the full audit report from KPMG. President Ekufuado has given the Ghana Revenue Authority the go-ahead to continue the audit contracts of the downstream petroleum sector with Strategic Mobilization Limited after receiving the report from KPMG. According to him, the deal is crucial in saving the country resources. But the fourth estate, which exposed the anomalies in the contract, won't the full report published here is lead investigator Manasi Azuriawani. Double that the president decided to look into it and certain actions have been taken. It is important to stress that the component of the contract that has been cancelled is the biggest component in terms of the revenue we are saving. The upstream petroleum and also the mining sector components of the contract per our production figures as a country we were going to pay about 90 million dollars to kpmg every single year so that angle has been uh, or component has been cancelled so it is significant savings in addition to some price verification aspect that has also been uh, cancelled now the part that is has been kept is the downstream petroleum contract. And that one, the president based his decision to keep the contract on the basis that SML is checking under reporting and under declaration. If you watch our documentary, we put this question to SML and ask whether they were doing under reporting or they were checking under the reporting or under declaration. The company said they were doing none of those services. It was on their website. It was on their website, and after we confronted them, they deleted that information from their website. The GRA, which awarded the contract to keep, uh, sorry, uh, SML, also told us that SML did not and does not check under reporting or under declaration. 
the most disturbing part of that contract is the measurement that SML's meter claims or meters claim to be taken. Those measurements are not used for tax purposes by even the GRA, which contracted them. We asked the SML engineers which of the recordings, you know, the, the MPA has a system called the ERDMS that is connected to the customs system, the ICOMS. And it is the figures that go through the MPA system that are used for tax purposes. And SML's uh, engineers explain that their meters, the SML meters, are non-intrusive. They are placed on the pipelines, but the meters at the depots that go through the MPA system that is used by customs, they take more accurate recording because they are intrusive. They take the exact measurement of petroleum product that goes uh, through them. So the very basis for keeping that contract that SML is checking under declaration, under reporting, the company has said on record, and it is on our, in our documentary, on camera, that we don't do those services. So on what basis then will the presidency be acting by saying that that contract should rather go on when KPMG, and as we've watched in your documentary, have clearly alluded to the fact that they are not doing that work. And in fact, I put SML, I should say, and have in fact gone ahead to take down that aspect from their website. But here we see in the president's directives that that contract must stay. So what, what might be contributing to that, especially when KPMG is simply telling you don't have that? Do you see that maybe KPMG has been shown contracts probably that have been signed, for which reason the president now says that should go on? Well, I would be very measured in perhaps uh, attacking KPMG until I see the KPMG report. Because I did a JIDA investigation, the president issued some directives on the JIDA report. But when the report itself was published, it was worse than what the presidency issued. This was in 2013. So with this experience, I'm a bit measured. But what we can say is that, look, it is good news to the Republic of Ghana that the upstream petroleum pro uh, contract and the gold mining contracts are off the table. Well, the Strategic Mobilization Limited has in the last few hours issued a response to the controversy. Kweku Asante joins me in the studio with details of that response. Kweku, how is the SML responding to this controversy? Well, Aisha, um, the SML statement is quite detailed. It responds to some of the concerns and the, some of the findings of the KPMG in this audit report that it investigated. For instance, when it came to the allegations of impropriety, KPMG... The report actually spoke about how some amount of money had been given and all that. KPMG says that report, according to SML, they believe that the report by KPMG debunks what they call a false claim that $100 million had been paid to SML by the investigators. You saw, you heard there in the investigation that Manasseh put out. They also talk about what they believe is that the need for SML services has been affirmed. And they think that the president asking them to continue with certain parts of this contract shows that this contract is important. It is necessary for the state to benefit from it. Then they disagree with certain findings of KPMG. They say that they disagree with the findings that a need assessment was not done before the SML co co commenced the operations. They also had disagree with KPMG finding that the transaction audit and external price verification agreements were all not properly done. And then KPMG also found in the report that the delivery of the contract was not up to a certain level and that they were below par delivery of the contract. Mm -hmm. So while the, the contract was important, KPMG did not do so, uh, uh, SML did not do so much of a good work. SML in this statement say they disagree with that from KPMG and they say SML rejects KPMG's assessment that it partially delivered on several requirements regarding the transaction audit service agreement and that regarding the transaction audit services, SML delivered fully on its obligations as outlined in the contract and then it goes on to talk about what they believe the KPMG misquoted certain figures or they were misled in making certain representations in terms of the amount of money that has actually been paid. KPMG in, the, in their report talked about how a compensation of 1 billion and 61 million CDs mm -hmm. have already been paid to SML. KPMG says, uh, SML says that is not so accurate. And then they, 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 they say that it's interesting to know that this figure is quoted without reference to the investments made and the taxes that have been paid by SML over the period within 
the consolidated contract. And so overall, they say that the KPMG report exonerates SML and confirms the need for the company's proven services, Aisha. Right. So it's, uh, it does appear that a lot more people are demanding mm. for the full report. Definitely, uh, the full report will put the matter to rest. Kwekwasanti, thank you so much for bringing us uh, those details. Let's now get to other stories. A prison service officer has sustained a gunshot wound after a clash between Prison service officers and military personnel Wednesday afternoon in Boko in the Upper East region. Details of the cause of the clash are still sketchy as the Regional and Municipal Security Council have remained silent on the matter. But some joint news sources in Boko said the military officers were angered after the prison officers protected some civilians who sought refuge with the prison officers after the military pursued them. The two civilians are said to have been a nuisance at a function at the Boko Chief's Palace. And when the military pursued them in order to discipline them, they ran to the prisons to seek refuge. The military officers then demanded that the prison officers release the civilians to them, an order which the prison officers were reluctant to obey, and, and, mis and misunderstanding ensued. I've been joined by Upper East Region correspondent Albert Story, who has more on this. Albert, what more details do you have about this incident? Yes, Aisha. So, as you said earlier, uh, the information we have gathered on this um, are a bit sketchy because the security um, apparatus have refused to comment on the matter for now. But uh, what we do know is that these two civilians you mentioned um, were, you know, uh, causing some sort of nuisance when uh, the Boko Naba was um, inaugurating a committee uh, for his 40th anniversary celebration. And so um, the army officers tried to, uh, the military officers tried to uh, discipline them and they ran away. Uh, they actually thought that they were not being pursued. But after a while, some of the uh, military personnel pursued them and they ran into uh, the prison's office. It was at this point that the officers went there and, you know, tried to uh, demand that they release these two civilians for them to discipline them. But from what we understand, the prison officers were also trying to um, plead with the military to um, leave them once they have realized their mistake. And yeah, they were pleading with them. But after a while, uh, it, it just sort of degenerated into a misunderstanding um, between the, the military officers who had gone to the prisons. And there was some sort of scaffold. And after a while, the military officers left the scene and later returned um, with more of uh, their personnel. And then uh, there was chaos. We are told that even uh, police officers came to the scene and tried to intervene. Um, but the, the prison officers and then the military officers would not listen. And it was um, a sort of, you know, um, exchange of uh, fisticuffs. It was a complete chaos, uh, very close to the prison's forecourt. And it was in this process that a, a gun was fired and the uh, prison officer that, that talked about uh, sustained the injury and he's currently receiving uh, treatment in the hospital. But one more thing uh, I should add, Aisha, is that um, some people also say that there was an earlier scuffle between uh, one prison officer and then another military officer some time ago, um, which resulted in uh, some prison officer, uh, I mean, some of the prison officers, you know, beating up the military officers uh, some time back. And so uh, there seems to be some sort of old uh, feud between them, which just sort of uh, also escalated because of yesterday's incident. But as I said, uh, as we speak, the regional minister and the municipal chief executive for Boko um, have not commented on the matter for now. So we do not know the, the exact details of how this whole thing um, started and where it is going from here. What's the mood in the area this morning? Well, uh, the, 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 there's not, uh, there hasn't been any problem. Uh, normally in Boko, when uh, people are short, 
because of the conflict, then there, there is some sort of tension in the air. But in this case, it's between uh, military officers. So uh, people are talking about it, uh, but then they are moving about their everyday activity. There hasn't uh, been any sort of disruption to uh, daily life in Popo, and so everything is calm at the moment. What we do not know is uh, how the, uh, the security hierarchy, in terms of the leadership, are going to handle this matter. Because uh, if they report that there is an old feud between these two factions uh, is still there, um, chances are that this thing is not going to end. And so these are the things that people are talking about. And some people are even worried that, you know, the security people who should be protecting the civilians are themselves engaging in this sort of thing. So uh, that's what is happening. Oh, sorry, our correspondent at the Upper East region. We'll definitely bring you more of this in our subsequent bulletins as it unfolds. We'll take a break on joining That's when we'll return this business. Africa, a new era has begun. Shifting our focus to a new horizon, connecting us with the one purpose to create and share opportunities to grow. brighter tomorrow, built by our dreams and our energy. Across our continent, across the world, we are creating a better way to a better future. A pan-African future, together. Ecobank, a better way, a better Africa. You worked hard for your money, and DSTV gives you a lot more to enjoy for a lot less than you think. So rather than fast food just for you, how about entertainment for the whole family? Instead of date night with your bae, how about countless nights for you, bae, and the kids? And don't settle for a few hours with your homies. Settle in with over 720 hours of the best entertainment on the continent. Triple drum roll. We've got everything, including movies, series, sport, kids. Totally awesome. And local shows. I'm here. Watch on the go with DSTV Stream and control your entire account with the My DSTV app. Yay! Enjoy incredible extras like Crystal Clear HD, Box Office, and Catch Up. And with so many different package options, there's something to suit every pocket. DSTV, a lot more to enjoy for a lot less than you think.
Hi, good morning. Welcome to Business. My name is Daryl Kwao. The Ghana Shippers Authority has criticized the practice where state agencies import goods and leave them at the ports, resulting in a cost to the country through demurrage and rent charges. According to the authority, the country lost $24 million to foreign shipping lines in demurrage, majority of which were incurred by state agencies. Here's more. The figures were disclosed at workshop organized by the Ghana Shippers Authority to educate representatives of state-owned agencies such as Metropolitan, Municipal and District Assemblies on the need to reduce them rate charges. Speaking on behalf of the CEO of the authority, the director in charge of operations, Sylvia Sanat Daudo, always said such acts lead to financial loss to the state. A casual look at the uncleared cargo list reveals consignment of state-owned agencies that have overstayed at the port with some chalking hundreds of days at the port. Even though these consignments are not forfeited to the state for purposes of auction, their eventual clearance will be accompanied by huge demurrage and rent charges accumulated over the period. The authority reiterates its appeal to chief directors, chief executives, managing directors and other relevant officers of MDAs, SOEs, to take urgent action to ensure that these consignments are expeditiously cleared from the port to mitigate the use of state resources for such avoidable cost. At the agency, as an agency established to champion the interests of importers, exporters in Ghana, the authority is of the firm belief that where shippers do not occasion delays, they should not bear the associated cost. This requires all stakeholders in the shipping value chain to be minded about the cost of their actions or inactions. Providing some recommendations on measures being taken to have a uniform system in accounting for demerit charges, Head of Shipper Services and Trade Facilitation, Mrs. Monica Josiah, said the authority is engaging all stakeholders on the issue. That when you get your own container, it's not as though you don't pay customs duty. But looking when you do the cost-benefit analysis, I believe that even paying the customs duty is better. And in any case, the customs duty remains here in Ghana. So at least you know that whatever you are paying will remain here in Ghana. So that, 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 that is what I want to say to that. Now, in respect of the getting the shipping lines to count demorage, like for us to have clarity and uniformity on uh, demorage free days, the authority has severally engaged a number of them. Currently, what we are doing is we are creating a working group with various service providers, including the shipping agents, for us to look at these things. And like um, the chair said, our law is also being strengthened to really give effect because uh, some people will start uh, counting demorage at different times. Now, last week, the government raised 3.34 billion cities through its Treasury bill auction, slightly below the 3.37 billion city target. However, Fidelity Bank's Deputy Managing Director, Ataya Boajan, explains that the reduced interest in the recent auction is linked to the Bank of Ghana's uh, recent policy shift, which raised the cash reserve ratio from 15% to 25%. This change has led banks to reconsider their strategies. Mr. Jan shared this insight with Joy Business at the Money Summit in Accra say that each bank has a reason um, for perhaps not participating in the auction for treasury bills. Uh, but the overriding issue, consideration now, is that, and I'm sure you know Bank of Ghana has increased the cash reserve requirement uh, from 15 to 20 percent and 25 percent, depending on where you stand in terms of your loan to deposit ratio. Uh, many of the banks are in the high end of reserving 25%. Now that's a huge amount of money and so if you don't have the, that money, and I don't expect banks to have the money sitting down, that money would either be in investment like treasury bills or in loans and so to meet that requirement your first, your preoccupation 
is to ensure that the money you have, any money that comes in, is reserved to meet that requirement. And so you have a choice between breaching the requirement and investing in T-bills. And I think as a bank regulated entity, your first option will be to meet the requirements before you think of investment. And treasury bills are investment instrument for banks. And so that probably is the reason why for the past two weeks you haven't seen banks participating as we used to be in those auctions. But I think individuals are participating as normal. So it has nothing to do with uh, fear of sovereign default or where the country finds itself. And I believe it's temporary. As banks meet, um, I'm sure they'll go back to the auctions and invest. Thank you. I'll be glad to have your complimentary. All right, there's more business news on our website, myjohnline.com forward slash business. Um, I shall be back to wrap up the news. And that's our wrap of the bulletin this morning. My name is Aishi Rhyme. Log on to myjohnline.com for more of the news and updates of all the developing stories. See you again at 12.